More than half the Toronto condo investors are losing money right now, and this is gonna be bad for renters. Uh-oh, this could smell a lot of trouble. I'll be breaking this down in this week's episode of Prime Properties TV. Now, if you're looking for some help on how to navigate this real estate market, so when you're investing, maybe you're not losing money, like some of these condo investors, you could book a call with me using the link that's right here. It's www.chatwithzen.com. Simply click on the date and a time that works best for you. And then when you see the prop, fill in your name, email, mobile phone number, and a question you have for me, and then we'll chat then. Good day, Toronto. Welcome to another episode of Prime Properties TV. My name is Zen, and I run and operate a Remax in the greater Toronto area on top of making awesome educational real estate content just like this one for you. And if you're enjoying the content I'm putting out there, make sure you help me spread the knowledge by smashing the like button and subscribing to the Prime Properties channel. Now, the one and only article we'll be reviewing today is, and it's a really good one, more than half of Toronto condo investors are losing money and that's gonna hurt renters. Bravo, Toronto Star. Great headlines. Whoever makes these headlines, use the server raise. The editor, I think. So what they're basically talking about is cash flow negative, meaning that the rents that um, are being paid right now to the landlords don't cover the mortgage because interest rates went up, maintenance fees, and a lot of those are also going up, taxes and general insurance and however you want to calculate you know, cash flow on a property because everyone's got their own different jam, right? So the thing I have highlighted here is that for the first time, more than half the investors who bought pre-construction unit as rental properties will be losing money last year. Now you have to remember, as interest rates went up, the other thing is that a lot of the condos that are coming into occupancy and registration, meaning they're ready to move in, they're right now are about to get really expensive because they had a jump up in price. So let's just call it a five year time frame, roughly to build. Obviously some are longer, some are shorter. Uh, you would have bought something for maybe like eight, nine hundred dollars a foot, you know, back in like 2018, 2017 from now on, so like five, six years. Now, if you bought in 2019 and 2020, or even a little bit like late 2018, I've been saying this, there was a date in February 15th in 2018 where the city doubled the development charges and I saw prices go up a hundred bucks a foot. And at that point, I kept saying it didn't make any sense anymore because you would have to project a few more dollars in rent. Obviously at that point, no one saw the pandemic and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It had some gains, had some drops back down because of the pandemic. But here we are right now where those things were at a 20% premium from what was sold like a year ago. And those things are coming due right now. And that's why a lot of people are losing money. I can first say we had some stuff that just uh, that we bought in 2017 and that's still cash flow positive. But anything that went from 2018 and onwards, depending on the project, very likelihood that it's negative. Now here's kind of the interesting thing, right? So the glory days of easy money and cash flow are likely over, agreed, that passed again in 2018. And on one hand, less investor activity means upward price pressures to a degree, but I think more importantly, it's gonna reduce supply, which is very problematic given the large deficit of rental housing that we're starting. And this is very important because you have to understand, the government hasn't really built a substantial amount of homes in like the last 20 years. Most of the housing, I would say like 90, 95%, especially in GTA, has come from private landlords because they go and buy pre-construction because honestly, like I've been saying, nobody has been basically buying uh, pre-construction for end users unless you're a downsizer who needs like an oversized unit of the terrace, right? Most people are buying the one bedrooms and the two bedrooms as investment or maybe for their kids because they don't need it right away. So they have that long time horizon and it can take the delays and the delays are better for them. But the problem is that if the numbers stop making any sense and prices are really, really high right now, I'm going to show you a little bit later, then a lot of these investors are going to be backing out of the market. And when the investors back out of the market, the builders won't be able to build anymore, right? Because they need the investors' money. Because basically what happens is we call it like a capital stack. The builder needs to sell a certain amount, take those deposits, use it in the capital stack so they can get financing to build the thing. Meaning if no investors buy it and it don't sell out, they can't go get financing on it and the project is basically not going to finish. That's kind of why you need the investors. And despite how many people hate them or whatever reason, right, without them, there's no rental supply. And even though you, people are saying that investors are driving up the prices, yes, to an extent they are, but without them, there's no rental. And then if people can't even buy it anyways, then there's going to be no homes for people, which ultimately still drives up the price, right? So that's kind of like a vicious cycle and why you know, housing affordability is such a hot topic. Now, this comes back to the issue of relying entirely on mom and pop investors to drive the rental supply. Okay, I just said that, yeah. <laughs> and ultimately, you're gonna be left with a big supply gap at a time when the rental housing is needed more than ever. So we're gonna have like a boom coming up in terms of completion. So uh, anything that was you know, bought in 2020, 2021, assuming we don't have any financing issues because those, again, so we're still at a little bit of a premium, we're gonna have a ton of supply come online because all, there was a lot of units that are sold in Q1 2021, right? 
and Q1 2022 as well. But what's happening in the last like, you know, Q3, Q4, it was record low, nothing was moving. Q1 kind of bounced back with some pre-con sales, but still not very high. So when you project that out five, seven years, you're going to have a housing shortage. And this is why I've been saying medium to short term, you know, a lot of volatility, but long term, the big fundamentals of GTA and the fact that we have too much immigration, not building enough, too much red tape is ultimately going to cause prices and rents to go up. Now, a lot of this stuff that's in this article is actually from a report from CIBC, Benjamin Tao, and Sean from Urban Nation to a really good follow. So I'm going to basically just review some of the reports here for you guys so that you can see some of the other cool things that are out there. Now, I've highlighted a couple of things. And the first one I want to show you is that the supply situation does not look any better because per capita, we're building less homes than we built 20 years. So this is very important because when you calculate the amount of homes, like the sheer number, that number is bound to increase because Toronto as a city is growing. But when you measure as the number of homes are building per person, it's lower than 20 years ago. This is the same example, as I've been saying, where the GDP of the country, it's growing because we're immigrating a lot of people that helps with GDP, but the GDP per person is going under, meaning the lifestyle is reducing. And this is why, again, another bullish case for why real estate long-term in Toronto makes a lot of sense, right? Again, I'm not saying go buy real estate right now because you have to still hold it until that period and some people may not be able to hold it. So don't, you know, FOMO into it, but that's kind of the fundamentals of why holding real estate right now makes a lot of sense if you can ride out the volatility. Right here is the number of condo starts, and obviously Toronto leads the way, but according to census, rental investors account for 39% of the total condo stock in Toronto and 59% of the units built in the last five years. So obviously people were uh, buying condos before, 40% were investors, now it's about 60%, and that's 20% higher, which again, people are gonna say, look, it's a good or bad thing, but I say, you know what, if 90% of the rental stock is being provided by mom and pop investors, right, then we have to let them go because you know our government isn't building rental buildings right now. And you have to understand, there are people building a lot of purpose-built rentals, and these are like big punch, uh, not punch, <laughs> big pension uh, funds, right? Because the money you need to build these apartment buildings is much higher because you need to be really well-funded to actually build these things. Whereas if you build a condo that sells it out to people, you can use a lot of the um, buyers, like the pre-construction buyers and investors, their deposit as part of your capital stack, meaning that you have like, say in a building of 500 units, you have 500 investors providing you money and liquidity so you can build this thing. So it's kind of leverage right but if you're building an apartment building you don't have that leverage of other people investing granted i know pension funds are using other pensions but i mean but i said or said it right but like the way that it's financed it's financed differently and that's why the incentive isn't really there to build a purpose built rental and that's why they remove the um, rent control so that it makes sense for uh, people to actually build these apartment buildings and that's why i think ford removed it in 2018. Now, another interesting chart here is the rising share of condos for rent. And you can see more and more are coming. And so this is where I say there is some rationale that we may be overbuilding these, but at the same time, when rental rates are going up, I would say we actually aren't building enough because you know if we were building enough, the rental rates shouldn't be going at high as much as we see right now. But one of the things that's driving this, I would say in Toronto is not necessarily like the PR coming in. A lot of it is students coming in because the universities are basically like washing their hands of like accommodating a lot of these like international students that come in who pay tons of money and that's the biggest revenue driver for them, but they're not responsible for housing them. So it gets pushed onto kind of the um, mom and pop kind of landlords out there and it's kind of a tailwind for them. Now here's kind of the very, very, very interesting chart. I'm gonna try to zoom in just for you. So this is the condo price versus rent. Now you can see in this blue line, this is the new condo price. And like I was telling you in 2018, they were fine, right? Relatively similar to re, uh, sorry, lo- relatively higher than resale, but again, you see this little gap over here, very, very small. So it made sense if you have a five-year build time that you can, you know, make money, and it would actually appreciate by then. And you're gonna see the rent rates, right, which is the gray line, are were also projecting going up. Obviously, we had the little dip during pandemic, and they've also gone back up. So at this point, this is what I'm saying, like, you know what? Some of these condos coming up, they're not bad. You won't be fully, fully under the water. But where we're seeing problems is right here, right? So you can see the gray line and the blue line right here. This gap just got massive, just massive. And this isn't the whole 
builders are making more profit. Actually, the problem is builders are making less profit and there's a lot more taxes, the costs have gone up, material have gone up, everything has gone up. So to actually build the thing right now and actually make some kind of profit, you need to be selling at these prices. And if you don't have buyers at these prices and given the headline right now that a lot of people are losing money, we're actually not gonna have enough investors wanna buy pre which means they're gonna have a housing supply problem in the future. You see, cyclical, right? And here's kind of a crazy thing where you see the condo rent, they're bouncing right back right up. And this is what I've been saying to a lot of my clients, right? So this little gap, there's a little bridge here, they're kind of going, but right here, because of the prices coming down, this is the arbitrage right here. If you're doing investment, again, it's still gonna be cash flow negative right now, but if you buy resale right now, it makes a lot more sense than pre-con because that gap is ginormous, right? So all you need to do is buy resale and then a few years, you know, again, if the numbers are right, they will match up to pre-con. But for pre-con to make money, you need to go above that. And we don't know where it's going to be with the looming recession, how long interest rates are going to be high for, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why I'm saying like pre-con, yes, it makes sense for some people with a lot of cash flow and to deal with tenants. But if you're trying to make the most amount of money, the arbitrage is in buying resale, right? So hope that kind of makes a lot of sense for you in looking at that chart. Now, here's kind of the economics of the condo. You can see right now, most people are buying pre-con. So you got 72% in this kind of, lighter blue yeah lighter blue they're buying uh, newly complete condos whereas only a quarter of them are buying resale and again that's the arbitrage if you're trying to look for it but remember still no cash flow positive right so here's kind of the exact amount right so they're saying that the average uh, new condo was 33 percent lower than the end of the year mls benchmark for resale units meaning there's that 33 percent gap so we you know when you're talking about kind of like what the pre-con gap is is why we kept coming to 33 percent or like sort of 30 percent and sometimes a little bit higher depending on like the project and what you compare it to now here's another very interesting chart right so they're saying the new condos see large appreciation which is correct and then if you bought previously because uh the newer condos are performing better with no rent control but what i want to point out here is that we found that only one quarter investors did not have a mortgage meaning 25% of the people who own condo investments don't have a mortgage on it. So this is, again, another reason why you're not seeing stress in a lot of the market, because if they don't have a mortgage on it, you know, they don't need to sell. But one of the things, I don't know how they calculate it, is if they use their home as leverage, the mortgage may be on the primary residence instead of on the condo. So there is some kind of like mortgage on the condo indirectly, right? Because when we talk to a lot of clients, some people just pull out a giant HELOC to pay it off and they don't get a mortgage because they can pay back the HELOC much faster than they can pay back the mortgage with the bonuses, right? So yes, there's some instances of that. I wouldn't say that many people buy in cash, but again, anecdotally speaking, we have many clients who come to us and like, hey, Zen, we got tons of cash. Where can I park the money? I don't need a mortgage, right? So there are a lot of people out there, like I think people underestimate how much money is in Toronto. I'm not saying everyone's really rich, but there's tons of people with money in Toronto. And you see right here, 75% of the people have a mortgage and 25% don't. Now, the other interesting point is that they found that for the first time in 2022, less than 48% of the leveraged condos investors were cash flow positive. So this is where this headline is coming up, right? Where half the people are losing money. And you can kind of see right here how that number has been going down because the cost to build has been going up and rents have been going up, but obviously not at the price of resale. And then when you mix in the fact that the interest rates are really, really high right now, that's why a lot of people are cash flow negative. And you can see in this kind of chart, which kind of breaks up the numbers, you can see the average rent here is higher than your cost and your mortgage in 2020. Again, made a lot of sense because mortgages were like at 1%. Then in 2021, you know, kind of the same breaking even. And you can now see in 2022, the cost is higher than the rent, right? So this is where you were positive a little bit, positive a little bit, we call it break even, and then now you're just fully negative. And again, in these calculations, it's not that bad. It's not like you're negative like a crazy amount. Like they're saying it's minus, I think, 2020, uh, minus, sorry, minus $223 right now, which is not that bad. Now, obviously, if you buy resale right now of 20% uh, down payment, your cash flow negative is probably more than minus 223 because the interest rates are really, really high, right? These are just taking into account what the uh, closings of the condos that were purchased like how many years ago for it right now. So that's why it's not like a definitive like cash flow analysis on the, uh, what do you call it, the resale market. But what's saying is that because prices have gone up on the pre-con side, very likely that this cash flow negative can get worse and worse depending on the interest rate environment. And then the last thing I have here is that there's a little interesting chart here saying, you know, how many bedrooms are being built and what the percentage are. You can see lots of studios, lots of one bedroom. So the shoebox in the sky is very much there. We're just not building a lot of the other units as well. Right. And again, that's kind of the challenge because you don't have a lot of like end users buying these three bedrooms or two bedrooms because when they're actually like large and functional, they get really expensive. Right. You might as well just buy a freehold home at this point. 
Um, so, you know, to actually get these things built, you have to gear it towards investors and investors love the smaller units because the economics of it makes more sense. So that's exactly why there's so many one bedrooms and studios. Again, all of this comes down to if you understand the incentive, you understand how and why things work this way. It's just because of all the policies and how we have to build these things and the condominium rules, this is why we have so many small units in the sky and why investors are actually the main ones kind of uh, buying these pre-constructions as opposed to end users. Now, here's kind of the final concluding point that I fully agree with them on. The get bigger picture issue is that investors may no longer be able or willing to buy condo pre-construction like pre-sales to the same extent as in the past. This raises the risk of reduced new condo demand, which new construction activity, deliveries, and ultimately rental supply goes down. All of this speaks to the need for more purpose-built rental housing, right? So you need a lot of bigger pension funds to come build this. Because at the moment right now, like I've been saying, short term, a lot of volatility, lots of stuff go all over the place. Long term, a lot of things are set in place that we're not providing enough housing for the amount of immigration we're coming. So we either stop the immigration, I've been saying this before, not to sound xenophobic or anything, but we stop the immigration, rebuild the infrastructure, set the policies correctly so that the incentive is correct to house all these people coming in or prices are going to go up. Or we change a lot of these things so that we can build more uh, and actually provide enough homes so that it's actually less. So the four unit upzoning is great. It's a step in the direction, but we need to fix the whole high rise solution as well and provide maybe one more incentives for like the larger pension corporations to create more rental supply. But again, you know, it will look as like greedy landlords, big corporations owning this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why like, if you understand how all this works, it's like a giant gong show and it looks like it's very, very hard to fix, but at least I think we're going in the right direction. But can we fix the problem in like five, seven years when these massive supply shortage is coming? Uh, I'm personally not going to say we can fix it. This is why I'm rather bullish on real estate in the long term. Again, long term, call it five years out. But in the short term, you have to ride the volatility. Anyways, hope this longer video kind of gives in a sense of idea of what the hell is happening in the kind of supply space, the condo space, and why there's a lot of attention on the kind of condo investment space right now and how more than half the condo investors are losing money. Trust me, it's going to get much worse because the pre-cons that are closing, or sorry, that were bought in 2020 and 2021 that are closing in three, four years, Unless prices rip like another 30%, those are not going to look pretty. Anyways, hope this helps. And if you are looking for some help on how to navigate this real estate market so you're not buying cash flow negative pre-construction without actually thinking about why it doesn't make sense for you, you can book a call with me using the link right here. It's www.chatwithzen.com. Until next time, your move, your future. See ya! Now that I'm done watching this video, I think you should check out this video. And you know what? Why don't you check out this video too?